the church was resistant at many points but covid 19 has won the argument for online education yeah it has the protests that have followed from george floyd's death and peaceful protests that are burning and looting uh, they have shown how terrible is the destructive is the consequence of university education in america mm -hmm. so the ground is ready american church has the capacity to disciple america american church does not have the theology to disciple the nation Welcome to Equal Justice Podcast, uh, where we seek truth, value traditions, and defend the foundations of moral and just society. Uh, my name is Jacob Daniel, and it's an honor today to have Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi, who is an Indian Christian philosopher, author, and uh, in many ways, a good friend, I would say, who I've had the privilege to know. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful ministry. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mangalwadi has authored many books. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Book That Changed Everything. Uh, it's talking about the Bible, how it has influenced many nations, uh, many people around the world uh, in bringing more human flourishing. Uh, he is also co-authoring a book uh, which is very soon going to be published. Uh, the title of the book is The Third Education Revolution, Homeschool to Church College. Uh, which is being launched soon and you'll be able to find more details on his website revelationmovement.com uh, Dr. Mangalwadi is spearheading an initiative called Revelation Movement um, the goal of which is to re-establish the cultural authority of veritas, truth uh, particularly in educational sector and, uh, and that's what we want to talk about more today um, Would you share a little bit more about Revelation Movement? Thank you um, the modern world began when the reformers in the 16th century put God's revelation, God's word, as the foundation of all of life. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was, is very simple, that if you have a dream last night, it's very vivid, very powerful, and it has puzzled you. Now, can I know your dream? Obviously I can't, mm. because only the spirit of man knows the thoughts of a human being. Yeah. I can know them if you reveal them to me in words. Language is revelatory, language is creative. It's a means of us becoming friends, mm. us getting to know each other. So Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 2, that only the spirit of man knows the thoughts of human beings, of a man, and likewise only God's spirit knows God's thoughts. Mm. And unless God reveals the truth to us in his word, through his words, we cannot know God. Yeah. So the whole education the first education revolution in Europe, which begins with the Carolingian Renaissance, and the second revolution, which begins with Martin Luther 500 years ago, both of them were built on the truth that human beings can know the truth, human beings can know what is right and wrong because God has spoken. Mm -hmm. But the Enlightenment divorced revelation and reason. So education was human reason trying to make sense of God's revelation. The words have to be interpreted and understood and applied. So education, a search of truth, was human reason trying to understand divine revelation, both in his words as well as in nature. Mm. But actually on Harvard Shield, Veritas, Veritas, truth is written on three books, V-E-R-I-T-A-S. Yes. So the book of God's words, the book of God's works, mm both in history and archaeology and in uh, nature, and the book of God's reason, which is in 
uh, human beings, we're made in His image. Yeah. So something of God is written in us. So all of this has to come together for us to know the truth. But once reason and revelation was uh, divorced, truth is gone. Hmm. So we live in a post-truth world. Truth is dead. Character is dead. The universities in the West have formally decided this is not our job to cultivate character, to train good citizens. We can teach people how to make good, good robots, but we can't teach anybody how to be a good husband or a good wife or a good parent. That's not our job. So you have tremendous moral uh, degeneration happening in the West. And a third revolution uh, that is uh, coming out of these books that I have written is to bring education back hmm. under the authority of revelation uh, and human reason is part of God's revelation because we don't really know what language is, what logic is, yeah. what imagination is, what intuition is, what dreams are. Um, we have speculations, but we don't really know our own souls. Mm -hmm. Philosophy cannot even know if we have a soul, if we are spiritual beings. So uh, a, a whole new revelation, which has many different aspects, that is uh, the next book, mm -hmm. the, which is really taking what I have already written about education in earlier books and expanding it. And after the, that, we have the next book, which we start working in November, which is on uh, human sexuality, gender, and worldviews. So during the last 20 years, the Western civilization has degenerated to the point yeah. that the universities don't know what is male and what is female. Supreme courts don't know what is marriage mm -hmm. and what is love and what is family, what is divorce. Uh, so they are undermining the very foundations of civilizations and therefore we're getting a whole group of scholars and that is becoming the pattern right now that I'm trying to get a group of scholars for each project. So the project on how the Bible created modern India hmm. will be a book by itself where a number of Indian scholars are participating. How the Bible created Korea, how the, Bible, the Bible's impact on Africa. Hmm. Uh, these are different books but including a, a book on, is the Bible really God's word? Yeah. So we will get a number of scholars who are uh, looking at the philosophical and ethical and scientific, theological, uh, historical, archeological attack on the Bible. Mm -hmm. Is the Bible truth? And so th this uh, it needs to be a number of teams yeah. working together to reestablish the intellectual, cultural, social, political authority of God's word and yeah. God's revelation. Great, yeah. And we both come from uh, India. And something that we usually don't talk about here in the West is that how much Bible has impacted not just the Western world, but also the rest of the world in reforming many practices and bringing about human flourishing. I would like to quote um, a couple of quotations that you have mentioned uh, in your introduction to the new book. You say that the university has amputated America's soul, uh, the sacred truths, America's worldview foundations. Uh, restoring those foundations requires a revival, a reformation. Um, and then you also say that having lost truth, the West has little option but to reject the exceptionalism of its unique liberty. Now this language is no more available. We no, no more talk about the exceptionalism of the Western world. Uh, what what do you intend by that? And I also want to ask, how is it that Christianity has lost universities? If we were the ones who began it, how did we lose it? Uh, so in terms of our culture today, how do you interpret it? What has caused us to lose this uh, educational sector? And how can we actually reform it or regain it? Well, thank you. Uh, each of them is a very important question, particularly the second question, how did Christianity lose the West mm -hmm. and Western universities? Um, uh, I have not been able to discuss it because not too many radio interviewers uh, ask those profound historical questions. So let's take the first one. Is the Bible really the foundation of America? Mm -hmm. Let's focus on America. Yeah. That makes it a little easier. 
the Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Now, that's a truth on which America was built, because of which uh, America succeeded eventually with the help of the Civil War to eradicate, abolish slavery, and then racial discrimination, bring human equality. Yeah. So this idea that all men are created equal, is this still a fundamental assumption of American society? If you talk to a high school graduate, a high school student in a public school, a typical high school student doesn't believe that all men are created. Hmm. let alone created equal. equal. Um, they're all evolved. So did we evolve equal? Hmm. That's absurd because evolution is not assuming that all people are equal. Uh, evolution is assuming that everybody is unequal. And inequality is a self-evident fact which evolution is trying to explain why different people, different races, dif different species uh, are unequal. So on the basis of modern intellectual consensus that nobody is created in God's image, uh, you, uh, but everybody has evolved, you cannot build an egalitarian society, mm -hmm. which means racism has to come back with a big bang mm. in America. And that's what we're seeing uh, in our culture today. Yes. So all of this attack on racism, white supremacy, its end result will be to establish white supremacy mm. uh, with guns, yeah. so with a civil war. Mm. So um, uh, this, because the only basis for believing in human equality is the Bible, because even when the first uh, when the Declaration of uh, Independence was being written, no one in America saw human being as equal, mm -hmm. not even the founders. No one thought that the slaves and slave owners are equal, male and female are equal. So it was not self-evident to anyone. It was not a, a inequality is self-evident. You don't need a a, science, a social scientist to prove that all human beings are equal, male and female are equal. Uh, anybody can see that if you look at Olympic medals, who wins the most medals? It's white races. Hmm. Uh, who gets the most Nobel Prizes? The Jews. There are some people who are, by any observable scientific yardstick, are more evolved. Hmm. Equality is a theological truth. It's not an empirical truth. It appeared self-evident to the founders only because their perspective was shaped by the first great awakening. George Whitfield, who was the second most important preacher who met, lived much longer than Jonathan Edwards. George Whitfield is the one who created the intellectual consensus that all men are created equal mm. because he was the first white man in America who started preaching to the blacks. And the white people, his patrons, got very upset. Yeah. That, what are you doing? Do you want our slaves to sit with us on the same pew in the church and drink communion from the same cup? Hmm. Are you making us equal? Now, Whitfield could have backed down because he made 13 trips to uh, England, England crossing yeah. the Atlantic. Hmm. He needed money for his itinerant ministry. Blacks had no money to give. The whites had the money to give. Yeah. And they were the ones who were getting angry by his ministry. Mm. Instead of backing down, he started writing in 1740 uh, a series of Bible expositions that all are equal because all are made in God's yeah. image. All are equal because all are descendants of Eve. She is the mother of all the living. Mm. All are equal because everybody has sinned. A white man is as much a sinner as a black man. Everyone is equal because God has loved the whole world. Jesus shed his blood for everyone. Yeah. It's his blood which determines our worth, etc. The Holy Spirit is given to everyone mm -hmm. who repents and believes. 
it's one spirit that makes us equal, etc. So he started writing a whole series of Bible exposition. Uh, and one of his uh, biggest amplifier in America was Benjamin Franklin. Hmm. Uh, he hero worshipped George Whitfield. But in the end, when Jefferson wrote the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, which I discuss in this book, um, Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred, meaning derived from sacred scriptures. Yeah. And they didn't originate in America. They actually originated in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, in Germany, in the church, priests got the bread and the wine. Late, he got only the bread. Mm -hmm. So inequality was institutionalized. Reformation said no. And the reason it said no is priesthood and kingship of all believers. That if all believers are priests, then everyone must get bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. Wars were fought over it. Yeah. Because it was such a disruptive uh, uh, challenge to inequality, a culture of inequality. That was the beginning of the whole idea of self-determination, isn't it? Yes. Um, but also of universal education. Mm. Because in 1520, exactly... 500 years ago, Luther wrote to a letter to Christian nobility in Germany that priesthood of all believers means that every child should be educated. Yeah. You can't do God's will unless you know God and his will. Uh, you can't run God's kingdom that his will should be done on this earth means everybody must know God's will. Hmm. So Roman Catholic Church invented the institution of the university. For 400 years, the university had existed before Luther. Uh, but it in, the university was an institution of the church, for the church, by the church. Even law universities hmm. were preparing co judges, which were bishops, chancellors, lawyers, overall priests and monks. So university was an institution of the church, for the church, by the church. But if the God's will should be done on all the earth, not just in the church, everyone must be educated. That's what created the sec what I'm calling the second education revolution, okay. which Luther takes the power of the priests, gives it to the people. people. And then Calvin also begins to take power of the kings mm. because he had the advantage of being in a republic in Geneva and gives it to the people, uh, which began to be realized in Scotland, uh, out of which the phrase in American constitution, uh, we the people, that's how the constitution begins. And thereby many other nations, including India. In, in Indian, we, yeah, the people. we the people. Why didn't they say we, the conquerors who defeated King George and mm. the British English armies? Yeah. No. Kingship of all believers means that every citizen takes responsibility for governing this nation. Mm. That's why you have elections. Yes. This is what began to be institutionalized in Scotland first uh, after 1570s. So um, uh, these fundamental assumptions came from the Bible. Luther discovers human equality in the doctrine that all of us are redeemed to become priests and kings. Royal priesthood, as uh, Peter puts it. Mm -hmm. um, and out of that, then the Reformation, as when it comes here in the form of the First Great Awakening, uh, not that the pilgrims were not already uh, did not already bring those ideas, uh, but uh, they didn't. Pilgrims didn't create the United States. The founders mm -hmm. did, and uh, the language was changed to pick up one thread by Benjamin Franklin. He put pressure on Jefferson to don't say we hold these truths to be sacred because there is our friend Thomas Paine out there who doesn't believe in revelation. Uh, he prefers to believe in common sense. That was my next question, actually. Yes. You know, just how could you sell this to someone who has, who believes that God is dead? There is no revelation. Well, if God is dead, human equality is dead. Yeah. If God is dead, inalienable rights are dead. 
And this is not just about the right of the unborn, pre-born. This is not about abortion. The rights of the parents to stay alive are dead. If parents can kill their pre-born baby, why can't grown-up children kill their parents? Hmm. If a widow is too inconvenient, she doesn't have a husband to protect her, look after her, why should the daughter-in-law have to suffer uh, uh, look, putting up with an inconvenient mother-in-law? It's much better to take her to Banaras, on the banks of Holy Ganges, leave her there yeah. as Deepa Mehta captures it in the film Water. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this problem aggravated after widow burning was banned. Earlier, if a widow is an in inconvenient person, you just burn her alive. Mm -hmm. But uh, once the British banned that in 1829, uh, and, uh, many Hindus decided that instead of l looking after these inconvenient elderly parents, just dump them in a festival in Banaras or Allahabad or somewhere there and let them become prostitutes or beggars or starve to death. Now that's what the West is doing now. Hmm. I was in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, two elderly men who were uh, ministering to in elderly homes, going, talking to people, praying with them, looking after them. They shared with me that some Indian businessmen are running these homes for elders mm. because children don't want to look after their parents. They dump them there. These businessmen who are running elderly home, they beat the elderly people, extract the last penny from them. Because an old man doesn't remember whether he already paid for this bottle of water yesterday. Yeah. You get him to pay second, third time. When he's penniless, all you have to do to get rid of him is to put a pillow on his head, keep it there for five minutes. Mm -hmm. He's dead. Children don't file any case against you because children were trying to get rid of the parents as well. Should children take care of their parents? Should a daughter-in-law take care of the mother-in-law when she is weak and vulnerable? Is there an alienable right? Is there a God who has said, you shall not commit murder? Hmm. Uh, is life precious, God's gift, that is to be cared for? Just like a pre-born, a newborn child can be difficult, therefore you kill him. Uh, and elderly parents can be difficult. Are we supposed to take care of them or are we supposed to kill them? And now the West is hiring Indians to kill their elderly people because this inalienable right to life is gone. Is there a God who has commanded that children must honor their father and their mother, which Jesus said means looking after them, hmm. not sacrificing them to God on the banks of river Ganges in order to in theory, serve God, become a priest. Yeah. Uh, so the whole culture, Western culture, was built on the assumptions that there is a God who has commanded. His word says that a woman, if she is godly, she must look after her mother-in-law, even if her mother-in-law had been mean to her. Hmm. Children, even if their parents had abused them, they are to honor their father and their mother. These, these were the assumptions of the culture. By rejecting the Bible, the Western civilization has amputated its soul. The universities, the courts, the church, theologians are the problem mm. uh, because we don't understand the simple truth that morality is submitting human nature to supernatural word of God. My nature is to be at attracted to my neighbor's wife. She is beautiful, she is seductive, she is sedu uh, um, intelligent. I can talk to her about President Trump mm. and about stock market, but my wife wants me to uh, mop the floor, wash the dishes, 
uh, and not do this, that, and the other. So wife can be very irritating and difficult while the neighbor's wife can be very uh, attractive. To subject my nature to supernature, mm -hmm. that no, I'm to love my wife, uh, who may be irritating me today. This is not natural for me to love, but I need supernatural grace. This was the foundation of monogamy. Mm -hmm. One man, one woman, lifelong, an exclusive relationship because God made one Eve for one Adam. He didn't make four or 70 in paradise, in Eden. Uh, this is what transformed the West. Mm -hmm. This is what transformed India. But the West did not understand and the universities didn't understand the secret of Western civilization, the success of the West, that West didn't become most evolved because superior biological accidents of genes, but because it was a civilization built on God's word, in obedience to God's word. And that's what this whole new education revolution and these books are seeking to restore. But we can take your second question, why did the universities lose? Yeah. And you want to re remind the listeners of, of your question? Definitely. I, I was asking, um, why is it that Christianity has lost the universities if we were the ones who began it? Um, and you mentioned losing that very idea of intrinsic worth of individual because God has created us all equal. And it's a revelation that God offered. Um, now, would, would you say it's unique to Christianity? that we all are created equal, that other worldviews does not offer this kind of idea? Absolutely. Uh, there is no other religion or ideology that affirms human equality and human dignity and human rights. This is uniquely Jewish Christian idea. Hmm. Um, now, America, fo focusing on American university, how did they amputate America's soul? America's decline began on July 4th, 1776, when Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, surrendered to Benjamin Franklin's pressure and changed the language that we hold these truths to be sacred, learn from sacred mm -hmm. scriptures, or we hold these truths to be self-evident. That was an epistemological shift. How do we know truth? Mm. Do we know truth through God's revelation? Or do we know truth through human reason, which in that specific case meant common sense? Yeah. Now, at that time, Thomas Paine had already written the book, Thomas, uh, or was writing the book, Common Sense, which was an argument uh, why America, sh the 13 colonies, should stand up against the British Empire and fight against King George the tyrant. Uh, then uh, Paine went on to write The Age of Reason. He wrote it in three parts. Uh, the, the book was called The Age of, uh, the Age of Reason, Reason. Yeah. in three parts, which now is available in, as one book. Now that was the book that really destroyed Western civilization. It was a frontal attack on the Bible. Um, the, the Bible is ridiculous, inconsistent, mm -hmm. absurd book, immoral book, etc., which was in India was rehearsed first by um, Satyarth Prakash, by Swami Dayanand, finally by Arun Shori, which got me started on writing my books. Yeah. Uh, but here you have Richard Dawkins has been the last one who has been attacking the Bible as a very immoral book, etc. But the they don't want to collaborate with Christians now yes. because the attack is now against them. Correct. Well. Uh, but also the feminist movement attacking the concept of God as father, yeah. as the source of patriarchy, the environmental movement attacking the Bible's teaching on uh, human beings establishing their dominion over it, etc. So many attacks come from many different yeah. sources, uh, which one of our future books will uh, take on in partnership with other scholars and experts. But this shift from truth coming from sacred scriptures to truth coming from human reason, from common sense, this is where 
decline of American university and American intellectual life began. You're not saying that we are discarding reason completely. We're discarding autonomous reason, okay. reason without revelation. Hmm. Uh, for the simple reason, it, the, the problem, the mistake that American theologians make and George Marston in his book, Fundamentalism and American Culture, which is in a sense a critique of what happened here in Biola, because mm. Fundamentalism yeah. was a series of books that came out of Biola. Uh, he shows uh, how uh, presidents of American colleges and universities kept r defending common sense mm. for 200 years unless until the age of nonsense was born because there were good and godly men intelligent men scholars in all of these universities and colleges ivy league colleges because everybody was a clergy who was teaching in these universities mm -hmm. uh, or at least the presidents they couldn't honestly say that look, if I'm going to rely on my common sense, on my human reason, I cannot believe in Trinity. How can there be only one God and Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God, they are different persons. And which again is a revelation. Because Trinity was never an idea cooked up by human mind. Yeah. As a model, it was an attempt to make sense of the revealed data. Mm. So, John in book of Revelation, in chapter 4, the heavens are, door is open in heaven. He is looking into heaven. There is a throne seated on this God Almighty, the Ancient of Days. In chapter 5, the lamb that was slain comes. Mm. Now, this is heaven. God is seated there. And all the heavenly beings begin to worship this lamb. To a Jew, yeah. that makes absolutely no sense. Then John goes on to use a very strange phrase. I saw the lamb in the center of the throne. God is seated on the throne. Mm. Jesus is supposed to be at his right hand. What does it mean that the lamb is at the center of the throne? Now, this is the revealed data. This is revealed to him. He's seeing it. And theologians are trying to make sense of it. Yeah. And that's how the model of Trinity develops, that the only sense is uh, that what Jesus had already said, Father and I are one. Mm. I'm seated on his throne. Uh, but if you are a rationalist relying on common sense, you have to be honest and you say, look, I love Jesus, I love the church, I'm a clergyman in the church, but I can't really believe in Trinity. So this Unitarians began to acquire political power in American universities. Mm. In 1805, that is just 30 years after the Declaration of Independence, the Unitarians took over Harvard University. That is, they captured the board. Yeah. Trinitarians got very upset. They fought back politically to try and regain control of Harvard University. They lost. Yeah. They fought year after year, election after election. They kept losing. And not only losing Harvard, they lost Princeton, they lost Yale, they lost Vanderbilt, they lost all the Ivy League colleges. At that point, there was a reaction following D.L. Moody hmm. that, oh, Universities believe in human reason, on rationalism. Uh, let's get out of these universities because they teach atheism. They're leading towards Unitarianism and atheism. Out of that reaction to rationalism was born the Moody Bible Institute. Yeah. Let's not go to Harvard University, which was Church's university. Let's go to Bible school, not university. Mm -hmm. That impacted Wheaton from Moody Bible Institute. So even today, Wheaton wouldn't call itself a university. Dallas Wheaton College, yeah. Dallas Theological Seminary, Fuller Biola, mm -hmm. which was Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Yeah. 
But it was only after Marsden's book and others began to criticize this anti-intellectualism, which became associated with American fundamentalism. Nobody calls himself a fundamentalist right now, but this was a fundamentalism which was anti-intellectualism. Uh, instead of bringing human reason under the authority of God's revelation, it rejected human reason. reason. Mm -hmm. Then let's not think, study philosophy, let's not study science, uh, let's go to Bible school after high school and study the Bible only. The consequence of that is for 120 years, American church, evangelical church has given to itself an intellectual leadership which is very weak and poor. Mm -hmm. That's why LGBTQ lobby could bulldoze uh, the resistance from the church and in fact have many of the church leaders surrender to the superiority of tolerance yeah which now in in this book that you mentioned I have a whole chapter on the history of tolerance how the Bible made the West tolerant Luther is the source of uh, American tolerance so when John Locke is writing his letter 200 years after Luther, a mm -hmm. uh, letter concerning toleration, he's quoting Luther. When uh, uh, the Bill of Rights is being introduced in America, uh, it is quoting Luther's, particularly his sermon on Marburg, mm -hmm. on two kingdoms. Um, Luther is the source of... Uh, Tolerance. Now, only thing you hear about Luther is that he crushed the peasants, he was anti-Semitic, uh, etc., etc. Th that's what even in Christian yeah. church history, uh, seminary seven professors will teach because that's the narrative being told mm -hmm. from the university. Uh, and they, uh, they don't know uh, the history of how a very intolerant European civilization was transformed to become tolerant. But uh, returning to the uh, heart of your question, how did, if the Bible created education system of the West, first revolution, eighth, ninth century, second revolution after 16th century, uh, Harvard was established in 1636, 1643 is when under the impact of John Amos Comenius' uh, teaching, uh, the uh, shield of Veritas was accepted. So the philosophy that governed these universities was a biblical philosophy mm -hmm. of education, that you know, the proper use of human mind, proper use of reason, that reason, uh, it doesn't matter what my IQ is, I cannot know what your dream was. Yeah. I cannot know your thoughts unless you reveal them to me. So ruling out revelation is to st say that we don't even understand what language is. And so there is no philosophy of language now, hmm. which is credible. Uh, we can talk about it more, but uh, perhaps not now. So uh, that was your second question. How did we lose it? And I'm saying that we lost it because the American theologians after 1776 declaration, instead of critiquing the idea that these truths are known to us through common sense, they defended common sense mm. instead of defending scriptures. So what I'm doing through these books and through this movement is correcting these two, 300 years of error in America which has destroyed America. Mm. And um, so you're, you're hoping that there'll be a reformation of yes. a new kind, but that has to happen through revolution. And that term has gained too much uh, credibility or in, in recent days, we talk about different kinds of revolutions. Sometimes they are radical. Um, how do you foresee in terms of bringing about that very truth uh, within our culture, within our education sector itself? And what are you proposing in terms of uh, bringing about that reformation? Well, the proposal is actually quite simple. 
For 1,000 years, the church has sent young people to the university. This revolution will get universities to send students to the local church. The professors will also come to local church mm. online. Okay. This means that the poorer student will be able to study under the best teachers. The cost of education will come down, come down but the universities will make a lot more money. Because instead of having 10,000 students, a university such as Biola can have a million students. Hmm. Students go to church, you don't need more buildings, you don't need more professors. Now, these students who are meeting in the church, just 5, 10, 15 students, they will have an academic pastor who is like a teaching assistant at the university. He is, it could be a homeschooling mom who already has an MA or a PhD or a doctorate of any kind, who is given a special course to become an academic pastor. Hmm. So he or she is supervising, so let's say homeschooling mom who has already graduated her three kids through high school. Now she can become a church college mom with a university training her and giving her credentials. So she's supervising the students six hours a day mm. and is responsible to make sure that they're completing all their work, that they're developing the team spirits. She will organize seminars. So the advantage of a uh, professor's coming online is that you can pause the professor, you can rewind the professor. Mm. Once he's finished a lecture and he, if one lecture doesn't have to have only one professor, one lecture can have three professors in 30 minute lecture. Yeah. And you can hear them second time. So you, the students are being taught by the best teachers and you can hear the lecture two, three times. If you still don't understand, then the academic pastor will bring either a face-to-face -face expert, an expert from the community mm -hmm. to come and meet with the students. And students from two, three churches in the neighborhood can come together to have a live seminar or she can organize a webinar uh, with the expert who is in the university. So students will go to the university physically uh, to do what cannot be done online. Particularly with the vocational training and all? If you want to learn how to deliver a baby, online you can watch a thousand deliveries, complicated deliveries, and you can get a much better understanding of how to deliver a baby or how to do a heart surgery. Uh, by observing online because you can see things that you cannot see if you were there in the surgical theater. But you obviously, in order to actually deliver a baby, you have to go to the local hospital. You don't want to be operated by someone who has just watched a video. Uh, no, but once you have learned theory, yeah. then you go to the local hospital, which is in partnership with the university and is credentialing that now, yes, you have actually observed 10 deliveries and you have done 10 deliveries. So are, are, you, are you suggesting that universities are merely facilitators? Yes. See, a thousand years ago when the university, first university was in Polonia, Italy. At that time, if a university student wants to buy a book, he can't because nobody's printing any book. Mm -hmm. Printing doesn't exist in Europe. Gutenberg is 1450. So it was 400 years after the university. Uh, monasteries have scriptoriums where all the scripts are being copied. So either scrolls or codex, mm. which is the book shape. And the paper is very acidic, very brittle. So students are not allowed to touch books. Books are where monastery is, the library is, Students have go, to go to the professor who have access to the books and they teach what Paul said and what Aquinas said and what Augustine or Anselm or Oregon or Plato or Aristotle mm -hmm. said. Students note it. If students want a book, they have to copy the book themselves. Yeah. But there is nobody selling paper. You have to learn how to make paper. So university began in a context 
where education had to be teacher centered. But today I can access a thousand libraries on my cell phone. So I don't have to go to the professors. I don't have to go to the library. Mm -hmm. uh, professors can come to me. So technology has changed the re reality and brick and mortar university is no longer necessary for most teaching. Mm -hmm. So even agriculture, this is what we began in Indonesia in, um, 10 years ago in 2010. Uh, uh, and I was saying to the Indonesian leaders that look, all the theory on agriculture comes online in the church. Even Muslim students come to the church to learn agriculture. Mm -hmm. But there is an agriculture extension officer who goes to every village and develops a model farm where students are cultivating. Mm -hmm. And uh, Monday morning in this village, Monday afternoon in that village, he is gathering the local students. If there are problems which he doesn't understand, students don't understand, all he has to do is take his iPad and tablet and uh, connect with WhatsApp with his professor, expert in the university, show him this is the problem, how do I solve it? If the professor cannot solve the problem, Professor says, okay, you dig out that plant, or you take, dig out that soil, bring it to the university. We will do the lab analysis and you can bring one or two students as well to see how this is done. So you go to the university and then you implement practice that. Mm -hmm. If necessary, the professor comes there, expert comes there uh, to that uh, village to solve that problem. So this is a radical new vision of education which is student-centered, not teacher-centered. It's a learner-centered education, and it is reintegrating truth, veritas, and virtue, character, because American University, beginning with the University of Chicago, has formally decided that character cultivation is not our responsibility. We are not responsible to build good citizens. We can teach students how to make good robots. Which needs to be happening at homes. Parents. But the homes aren't there, the fathers aren't there. Yeah. <laughs> so you, the university has destroyed the home. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so they're saying, don't go to church, don't bother sticking with your own wife. Uh, so you destroy the church, you destroy the home, and then you say it's not our responsibility to teach ethics, which was the actual resolution mm. um, passed in um, the University of Chicago. I can talk about it, um, how that happened, but it's not necessary. So American University has decided that we can teach, our job is to teach students how to make good robots, uh, but not how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, how to be a good citizen. Uh, that's not, I'm paid to teach economics, I'm paid to, uh, paid to teach chemistry, I'm not paid to teach ethics. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if, um, as Christ says, uh, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. And don't you think uh, by sending or by giving away our children over to the state to educate them, we have rendered to Caesar the very image of God that is on our children. See, uh, the problem at Luther's time, 500 years ago, was that the idea of inequality of priest and laity meant that the priests were educated, laity was not. Priesthood of all believers meant that Luther was taking the power of the priest, which is power of knowledge, giving it to the people, everybody. Mm. So the priests aren't going to do it. They hate Luther. They want to kill him. That's why he addresses his letter to German Christian nobility. Uh, that you, the church isn't going to do this. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that God's word is being obeyed that every child is being educated. So Luther does bring 
No, because his own university at Wittenberg was funded by Frederick the Wise, who, yeah. the Wise, who is the local patron mm. and the king, the prince. So the prince must be responsible, the state must be responsible. Now, how do you finance education is a problem from the beginning. Yeah. Once the Reformation succeeds, Scottish Reformation abolishes all monasteries, takes their wealth. 50% of that wealth is put into mass education because the reformers have captured political power. Mm -hmm. So they take 50% of the wealth, put it in universal education. And so Scotland becomes the most educated part of Europe at one stage. Well, then England, Henry VIII does the same of abolishing monasteries, mm. but his treasury is bankrupt. So he keeps most of the money in his treasury from monasteries because monasteries were the mega industrial complexes at that time. Uh, and then some of the money he puts into um, universities like King's College or Trinity mm. College Trinity College in Cambridge is his college where yeah. um, Newton was or um, a number of celebrities including our um, um, Babing Thomas Babington Macaulay from India etc. They were all there. So uh, that's where he puts money from, which is taken from the tre uh, monasteries. How do you finance education is the problem. Initially the Oh, parents are illiterate in Germany when Luther begins to sell his idea, uh, promote, champion his idea of universal education. Parents cannot educate the kids. They have to go to the farms in the early morning, sunrise, come back at sunset. The fathers don't have the energy. The only literate person in the village of the town is the pastor. Mm. So the first school in Germany is called homeschool. Yeah. But this is pastor's home. So students go to the pastor's home every morning. They go home for lunch. Uh, they, uh, so Luther writes the shorter catechism, which every child is to memorize. He writes the longer catechism, which is the teacher's manual for the pastor. Mm -hmm. As the child is growing up, yeah. he must really understand the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles Creed etc. So you're equipping the pastors to become the teacher uh, and so homeschool after it, at that time you don't really learn math and writing. If you want to learn math and writing this child has to come back after lunch and then you have to pay a little to the pastor. So he's spending. The tutor. Yeah. yeah. But then after that, you go to grammar school, Latin school, uh, when you're older. The first education is in German. Mm -hmm. Now, this continues the church being responsible for education until 1832. After Napoleon, when his secularizing conquests, uh, 1832 is when state takes over. Uh, the education which is the department of the church. Mm -hmm. Now the church is happy because what this means is now that the church is, the state is going, taxpayer is going to finance education. It makes no practical difference to the management because most of those countries have no voter registration. Mm -hmm. Membership of the church makes you a citizen. So who is electing the Ch uh, school board. Yeah, it's the church, church. member. So pastor is inev inevitably because as an uh, educated person, he is the chairman of the city education board. Hmm. So for 30, 40 years, generation or two, the church and the education in Europe, although state has taken over, is still a still part managed. of the church culture yeah. and therefore church is happy. And which is not the case now. So It so, changes. Yeah, so my, uh, a question to add to that is that 
how can we think about educational uh, revolution or reformation without any political revolution to bring about policies that well, will enable it? What I'm proposing as part of this educational revolution is education banking. Can you elaborate uh, on that? Yes, uh, it actually comes from Kerala. Uh, you have an evangelical bank, which is microfinancing, has begun to finance education. Hmm. So uh, think of a village in Uganda. If a child has to learn from the best teachers, teachers have to come online. Child has to have a laptop. His parents can't afford to give him a laptop. Fees will come down because the, the child is no longer paying for buildings, hmm. not paying for teachers' retirements. Um, so the fee comes down, but still there is capital investment. So if there is an educational bank, which is the church and the academic pastor recommends that this child, this family, should be given so much money to buy a laptop and software and equipment that, that he or she needs. Um, so there is an agreement between the academic pastor representing the church and the family. The child is little, but the parent is taking responsibility that we will pay $2, $5 a month repaid or a week. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine that a family is so poor that they cannot even pay $5 a month or $3 a month. Well, the, past, the academic pastor could recommend to the bank that let's help this family roast and boil peanuts and sell boiled peanuts so their income is increased and they are able to pay. Mm. So now imagine that the church is a mud hut with thatched roof. There is no space or safe place for kids to sit rainproof. And that, that church needs a little resource to add a room, which is a classroom. So the church can qualify to apply for uh, an, a room, which is rainproof, heat proof, where uh, the, the, the village, the church members build a room, but a smart TV, a smart phone, uh, uh, etc., is provided by the bank. So, the advantage of not the taxpayer funding the money, which the state gets to control, take teachers' union to get to control what is being taught, but parents taking responsibility. And eventually when the child is becoming a student is becoming an adult, student takes the responsibility for the loan. And if they are faithfully repaying, then they qualify for bigger uh, loans mm -hmm. to start their own businesses. So what you are injecting in these poor countries is what uh, Max Weber called the Protestant ethic and spirit of capitalism that I'm borrowing the money in my education or my child's education because this education is supposed to equip the child to become more productive, creative, and generate the resources. So it strengthens the economy of the family, the church, and the nation. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, a model. Now this is where Operation Mobilization, for example, uh, that launched the schooling movement and tried to get compassion and other sources to donate money. Mm. They undermine this, uh, the sense of responsibility of, of the student and the family and the church to borrow. So t today we have the capacity to establish educational banks, which are microfinancing, mm. but uh, it is educational microfinancing in the process if some of the families need that additional help and churches need additional help, we give. So that's part of this third education revolution that who really owns, the res has the responsibility for education. Yeah, uh, I know that you're hoping for a global movement and um, 
if we bring our focus back to the West, especially here in America, if I may ask, how optimistic are you in terms of bring, seeing this come about in light of uh, the infiltration of so much of Marxist idea, the idea of big government, uh, that the state should control? Well, th this is where people like you will be needed to help fight the theological intellectual battles. We'll have intellectual battles within the church and we will have intellectual battles outside the church because the uh, yesterday I was preaching in Redlands and my text was 1 Timothy 2 4 and I warned them, my audience that I have a habit of misreading the Bible so you please open your own Bible and read it correctly and I read the text God wants, Paul writing to mm. Timothy, God wants all men to be saved and go to heaven. Everybody said yes. So I said, well, that's what, how I read my text. What does your Bible say? Mm. People then began to look. No, no, no. Paul is saying, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge oh, of the true. truth. It goes on to say in verse 7, I'm an apostle and that means I'm a preacher and a teacher of truth to Gentiles. Mm. It is the truth that is turning the world upside down. As a preacher, I cultivate faith. As a teacher of truth, I make sure that the faith is rests on the knowledge of truth, not on ignorance. He goes on to say in chapter 3 verse 15 that uh, church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. If the West, if America has become post-truth, the president keeps saying, don't believe the press. They're very educated, very brilliant, but they are both fake news. So, and the press returns the compliment that the president is post-truth. Mm -hmm. So don't believe the news and the products of the university. Don't believe the politicians. Don't believe the courts because they, they don't even know what is male and what is female. So you have a nation which is being destroyed, as Hosea 4, 6 says, uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. A people without knowledge, that's verse 14, will come to ruin. But part of the anti-intellectualism of fundamentalism in America has been that American theology has separated uh, Salvation from truth. Hmm. Salvation is by faith alone means truth is irrelevant. It's the job of the scientists and the politicians and the lawyers to find the truth. We are only interested in faith. Salvation by grace alone hmm. means knowledge of truth is irrelevant. But that's not understanding the gospel. John says in John 1 14, we saw his glory full of grace and truth. Law came through Moses, that's verse 17. Grace and truth came through Jesus. God is a spirit, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, our pastor right here in um, Redlands used to uh, read um, that verse, um, a number of verses, by Isaiah 11, uh, Isaiah 53 verse 11 says, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Hmm. Not by his blood, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. But that whole aspect of the knowledge industry, which came with Judaism, which came with the first great awakening, second great awakening, has been lost. So uh, we will have attacks from the external world, but our biggest problem right now is from within the evangelical community, mm -hmm. because this revolution, like all revolutions, will have conflicts. There is no reformation without theological conflict. So. What is the role of the knowledge of truth? Why does God want all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Is church the pillar and foundation of the truth? Or is church just about cultivating faith? Yep. Uh, those issues are 
require a lot of discussion and re reworking how is the church the uh, means God's means for healing of the nation mm -hmm. so uh, yes so we need a number of uh, Christian thoughtful Christians engaged in this in writing in preaching and therefore I'm very grateful for this podcast that at this moment of course as we have run out of time we are only uh, introducing topics yeah. but what has happened thanks to COVID see I published this vision in 2009 in a book called Truth and Transformation published by YWAM in Seattle that's when I first proposed this education revolution the third appendix of Truth and Transformation but uh, in 2014 we succeeded in getting a Lutheran church in uh, Minnesota to begin to experiment mm. uh, and the, the senior pastor who resigned as a senior pastor became an academic pastor he is one of our leaders uh, Dr. David Glesney and you should have him sometime sure. on the podcast um, but um, basically the church was resistant at many points but COVID-19 has won the argument for online education it has the protests that have followed from George Floyd's death and peaceful protests that are burning and looting. Uh, they have shown how terrible is the destructive is the consequence of university education in America. Mm -hmm. So the ground is ready. American church has the capacity to disciple America. American church does not have the theology to disciple the nation. It cannot even define the nation. Hmm. Uh, and this is a problem that began with Fuller uh, Seminary, the nation means people group, and was promoted by uh, the US Center for World Mission and promoted by Biola uh, Missions Department Intercultural Study, the nation means people groups. Uh, all of these things have to be questioned that is the church responsible for discipling the United States of America is United States of America a nation in biblical sense of the word mm. does God wants want the USA to become a great nation this is a problem with Trump is facing then most Christians don't believe that U.S. is a nation or God has any interest in making U.S.A. a great nation. We are all waiting for rapture. We are waiting for the Antichrist to come and rule. His will must be done on earth, not God's will. God's will should be done in the millennium, if there is a millennium. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, these are yeah. theological, eschatological issues. So the last time, the only time actually in, the, in recent years that I've spoken by Allah, it was actually an emissions uh, event when I explained 45 minutes the great damage that uh, premillennialism has done to Christian mission. So all of those controversies will have to come in mm -hmm. uh, to, tr um, uh, to repeat, American church has the capacity to disciple the nation. It does not have the theology to disciple the nation and it has been robbed of that theology by Bible institutes and that's why this is a revolution that is as much about reforming theology and reforming the church as it is about reforming education wonderful um, so how is it that someone who is watching us today and listening to us today can join this movement and uh, with whatever capacity it might be a, a mom listening or a dad listening or a pastor listening uh, or anyone else maybe a student what is it that they can do in terms of joining this movement at the same time uh, be available in their own context to bring in this idea of intrinsic worth uh, as a revelation as something that God has given us and that's something need to, we need to be fighting for and preserving. First thing, every Wednesday at 1 o'clock uh, or 12.30 uh, afternoon Minnesota time, Central time, we gather on Zoom to pray. Hmm. So those who want to get involved should come 
and pray. Last Wednesday we had fasting and prayer because this has to rely upon God. Yes. Um, and this is not a human battle. Second, people should buy this book, The Third Education Revolution. And we, in about a week's time, a 10 days time, we, it will be going into production. And you'll have so, details on your so website? I'll have, I'll put the details up. We have actually just been discussing the cover. And, so, and we'll mention uh, the website again in the uh, description box. Re okay, revelationmovement.com. So we'll put the cover and the order uh, 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 for the book. So people should buy the book and give it to their pastors. Because pastors are very busy. And we need a lot of homeschooling moms and dads. They are the revolutionaries in America. Mm. They are resisting the diabolical education. Uh, so th that is the constituency that uh, I'm putting my initial hope from. Eventually, we need university professors and um, school teachers uh, and theologians. Uh, but it is really the homeschooling moms and dads who are older children who are beginning to look for college and who are afraid that sending my daughter to college is sending her into red light district. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the people who need to get the book, give it to their pastors. And if two or three moms ask the pastors to read it, so the pastors begin to get this new vision of the church. We need many more books, the church and the healing of the nations. Is the church responsible for the healing of the nations, etc.? But this is a beginning of just on the education sector. Um, but uh, the third thing would be that we will we need participation of scholars in different writing projects. This is team building, and uh, then obviously we need some universities to get involved. Uh, the there should be curriculum for training academic pastors. And we have some proposals and concrete models uh, and we ho hope to get organized. And th there is a prayer because we have submitted a vision proposal for major funding. As you said, it's a global yeah. education revolution for the next 20 years. So uh, the decision right now, the, our proposal is in Australia and we need the Australian authors to clear it they will send it to the third level. Uh, it has already cleared the first level, which is British office. Um, so we, we need the resources. Uh, this is uh, most likely the core of it would be a for-profit where we are creating curriculum. So we will get experts to come together for one, one subject to decide a curriculum. Mm -hmm. What is the best curriculum? Work with script writers videographers, musicians, editors, animators to create the world's best curriculum, better than anything MIT or Harvard or Princeton or Oxford mm -hmm. is giving. That's the curriculum we want to take to every village in India or Uganda or, or Sudan uh, to offer the best available education content. Uh, uh, so online pedagogy is different than classroom pedagogy, face-to-face pedagogy and so subject matter experts who know the subject will work through with online pedagogy experts and videographers. So uh, these teams are being built up mm -hmm. and uh, your audience are invited to participate. If somebody says I'd like to help create a curriculum on how to bake good cakes and how to decorate cakes, we would welcome them. But a part of this is creating an edu educational ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So today, any student anywhere in the world who is researching for a paper goes first to Wikipedia. But Wikipedia has become more and more ideologically committed and corrupted. Mm -hmm. So an alternative collegepedia where uh, we mobilize a million professors, teachers, professionals, experts, researchers to help create an alternative encyclopedia which is grounded in truth, grounded in virtue and character, which is reorganizing all the information as collegepedia. 
So this is this would take a million people mm -hmm. who would begin to help create. So a, a student or anybody who is researching a topic it is not going simply to secular, liberal, anti-Christian uh, encyclopedia, but has an alternative. So this is part of uh, the educational ecosystem. There's room for everybody to get involved in this, but let's begin every Wednesday, uh, one o'clock central time with, with prayer. prayer. Amen. Um, you've given much to think about and I really want to thank you for your time that you've given well, us. Thank you. This is a wonderful uh, ministry. Uh, I'm grateful once this is up and running, I will uh, advertise it and I hope the viewers will share it sure. uh, as a vision. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. And I also want to thank our audience uh, that we will take the charge that's been given to us today and be able to um, seek to go where the Lord is leading us to and follow the truth where it will take us to. And I hope you will join us again for our next podcast very soon. Have a good day.